Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It was almost three years ago when the DART spacecraft successfully completed its mission by smashing into the asteroid Dimorphos, a small moon of the asteroid Didymus. This mission was unlike other missions. It was carrying a number of new technologies for testing, and ultimately the mission was going to test whether you could change the orbit of an asteroid by hitting it at high velocity. And indeed, they did measure a change in the orbit. Now, you might think this is something that could be modelled by computers, but it turns out that a pile of rubble is an immensely complex thing for supercomputers to handle. And that's probably why, three years later, we're still finding out all sorts of new and interesting things about what happened during that instant of that impact and what unfolded over the subsequent minutes. And this year, there was this new paper which was published with new restored imagery showing the fly past. Since the main spacecraft was going to be destroyed in an instant, it carried a second spacecraft, a 6U CubeSat called Licia Cube, the light Italian CubeSat for imaging of asteroids. The cameras were named Luke and Leia, the Licia Cube Unit Key Explorer, and the Licia Cube Explorer Imaging for Asteroid Instrument. And now, one was a black and white narrow field camera, that was Leia. Unfortunately, that wasn't in focus. Now, of course, because the spacecraft was in deep space, it had to perform all its own camera pointing and control, which is no simple feat for a tiny spacecraft. And you'll see that at closest approach, when they flew past at 7 kilometers per second, less than 60 kilometers away, that they didn't quite keep the asteroids in the center of the frame. Also, you'll notice that from one frame to the next, the noise is changing between these images. That's because as they're flying past, they don't know what exposure to use. So they would take the images in sequence, but with different exposures so that they would cover the complete range. And that does mean if you try to make movies for them and try to normalize everything, the noise level is going to change. And so while this paper was really interested in looking at specific boulders, just the animations they've produced really brings this whole scene alive. As the spacecraft is flying in, we can now see as it swings by that this cloud is very much a cone, right? An ejector cone which is coming out of one side of Dimorphos, the small asteroid. We've seen these images before, but this just really brings it out there. It's also tempting to think, by the way, that as the camera moves over like the sheet, the ejector sheet, it's tempting to think that the spacecraft probably flew through this, but given that it's like 50 kilometers out, the ejector would have to be moving at a couple of kilometers per second. So there might be some small fragments, but it would have to be very, very small and unlikely that it would actually hit the spacecraft this far out. It's also notable that this is actually a pretty well-defined ejector cone. There's no fragments getting kicked off the backside. Again, we weren't sure about the dynamics of a rubble pile, whether we would see stuff shooting out in all directions where the entire object would be pulverized, but we actually appear to have a pretty well-defined ejector cone. What's also neat is you can see it's not really a cone, it's more like a curve, so that the what, what's happened is the ejector cone has changed angle over time. The earlier cone was narrower, and as time went on, it got wider. And the way to think about this is as this thing has created a lot of energy, it's basically excavating a hole and blowing stuff out. And as the hole gets wider, the cone also gets wider. So that shows that over the time that it took to eject this, the there was like active excavation going on. They have a nice little image sequence that I'm uh, ping-ponging which shows a close-up of Dimorphos on the left. Obviously they are rescaling the image as we as the probe is receding. That's why the resolution is changing. But look, you can see the, for the shape of Dimorphos with this very big ejector cone being blasted out. Also the authors point out that there's a region on Dimorphos which should be in shadow but it's not because the ejector plume is sufficiently intense that it's scattering sunlight into this otherwise dark area. Another thing that's obvious about the ejector cone, which I, I've mentioned before, is that the filaments coming out look wavy, right? And in space, when stuff tends to get kicked out, it tends to go in a straight line unless it's getting pushed about. So why do these things appear to be waving? And some people thought, oh, maybe it's electromagnetic fields. But, you know, the, the answer really is very simple, that if you're hitting something which is basically a pile of dust and rubble, then the dust is going to shoot out very, very quickly. But if it hits a piece of a boulder, then it's going to get bounced off. So those bigger 
boulders are moving around, but they're not necessarily moving directly outwards. They're moving to the left and right a little. And that's constraining where the jets of dust are being projected. So those positions changing over time cause the waviness in those lines. And so that brings me neatly to what this paper was really looking at. They were wanting to track boulders, what were seen in this imagery. So these are a number of objects that they have identified during close approach, and over a few seconds they are able to try to uh, like track them from one frame to the next, and by extension then figure out what their velocity is. They identified and tracked over 100 boulders in this data. And by the way, I should point out that three years on, this data is available to anyone to go and download and process if you want to make some cool movies of your own. But yeah, using the positions between multiple frames and the motion of the spacecraft flying past, they can reconstruct the position in three dimensions relative to the impact site. And by looking at the time versus the distance, they can figure out how fast they were going. So a lot of these objects they measured, they were about one meter across. Some of them were smaller, you know, half a meter. Some of them were slightly bigger. The velocities were typically 10 to 20 meters per second. Some were much faster. There was a 0.4 meter boulder observed at 8.8 .8 kilometers away from the impact site, which means based on the time, it had to be moving at about 52 meters per second. That's over 120 miles per hour. And given this had to be accelerated to that speed quite quickly, it shows you that this is actually a solid piece of rock or a fragment of something that was less solid. The largest chunk they found they estimated to be about 3.6 meters in diameter, so that is well over 10 tons of space rock. And to be clear, despite the ejection velocities, the, none of these things will come anywhere near Earth in the foreseeable future. Also, intriguingly, they pointed out that these boulders were not randomly distributed across the sky. They actually appeared to be correlated in a couple of clusters. So this is a map showing like the ejection angle and the velocities, and you'll see that they te do tend to get clustered in terms of their angle and in terms of their velocities. And with this in mind, they make one great leap to suggest that maybe these are both fragments of larger boulders which were pulverized on the surface. This is the final image that was captured by the spacecraft just over a second before final impact. Now, this would have been about 10 kilometers out as using a narrow view uh, telescope to be able to guide itself into the target. But right in the middle there is pretty much where the main body of the spacecraft hit. And you'll notice that there are actually two pretty prominent boulders there. And these rocks actually got nicknames from the team. One's called Boran and the other's called Atabak. And I probably mispronounced those. Anyway, uh, yeah, if they take the logical conclusion that these boulders are shattered into smaller boulders and ejected, well, for the southern cluster, it does actually line up pretty well with uh, Atabak. The case for Buran isn't quite as clear because the ejection is going off at an angle, but maybe it's the solar panel that really triggers it. So you'll see these white boxes laid on there. That is where the spacecraft was expected to have impacted. And so the solar panels extending upwards, uh, they would actually have hit the surface first, although most of the mass of the spacecraft is actually in the core. They did do a quick sanity check and verified that the amount of boulders or the sizes of the boulders that came off are smaller than these larger boulders as seen on the surface. That's consistent. Uh, that's true in both cases. The boulders and all of the boulders they counted, they estimated that the mass was maybe 100 tons, but it could well be more because that is based on the bulk density of the asteroid. And the bulk density of the asteroid is presumed to have lots of voids because it's a rubble pile. I mean, even if only one of these is right, it's still pretty neat detective work. I mean, just imagine it. You're some space rock that's sitting on a bigger space rock, just minding your own business. And then this inconsiderate space probe screams out of nowhere, blasts you into tiny pieces. You and your buddies all go off in different directions. You know, you're never going to meet each other again. You might all end up falling to Earth at one point. But yeah, that's pretty much, you know, your life has been changed radically as a rock, obviously. What's also interesting is because so much of these boulders were projected like downwards with respect to the plane, they actually, you know, crunched the numbers on the mass and the velocity it was projected at. And this is actually enough to put slightly less than one degree of inclination into the orbit. So while they were trying to adjust the orbit, you know, in terms of its period, in terms of its uh, semi-major axis, they might have also given the orbit a little bit of a skew. Now, we can't measure that from the ground, 
but we have another space mission going there that might be able to measure this change. Hera was a European mission that was originally pitched to get to the asteroid before Dark got there. Now they've finally got the money to it, it will get there afterwards and it will find a changed system. It launched in 2024, it flew past Mars in a gravity assist earlier this year, and it should arrive at Didymus in G December of 2026. And of course, en route, it's already been testing out its sensors. One of the things it did as it flew past Mars was it arranged an encounter with Deimos, one of Mars's moons. Uh, it also used the Mars as a like a test subject for the feature tracking software because the spacecraft is going to be operating near an asteroid in deep space. It would be great if it was able to autonomously perform a bunch of navigation maneuvers itself. Since asteroids are irregular in shape, it needs to be able to figure out its position relative to them. Therefore, it needs to be able to track features on the surface and make, you know, the understand where it is as a result and make the observations like this. So yeah, this is it flying past Deimos. I think uh, it flew within 300 kilometers, which, you know, the, the images weren't as good as those produced by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, but it's always nice to get fresh imagery. I'm really hoping that Japan's MMX mission will finally get us some really good close-ups of uh, Phobos and Deimos. And of course, hopefully we won't find demons there. I, 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 like many other gamers, are intimately familiar with the Martian moons of Phobos and Deimos from my time playing Doom. And based on that experience, I can in fact tell you that the BFG-9000 from Doom is not nearly as powerful as the Dart spacecraft smashing into an asteroid. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.